Hello everyone, and welcome to our lecture on unsupervised learning from the Techniques for Self-Driving Cars course. I'm Lucas Nunes, and today we'll be talking about unsupervised methods for perception in the context of self-driving cars. So in the perception lecture, we saw different perception tasks, and especially in the light learning-based methods, the data notation is essential for training the convolutional neural network. But the process of labeling this data is hard, so today we can discuss what can we do without the, those labels. In the perception lecture, we have discussed about 2D and 3D LiDAR sensors, as well as the challenges and advantage of LiDARs and how they measure the environment. So we also discussed about convolutional neural networks for point cloud data and about the different LiDAR-based perception tasks. For such learning-based methods, before deploying to the real world, a series of important steps uh, are needed to train the, the network. So first, a sensor mount needs to be prepared and fixed and, and set it up. Then we can mount the sensor on top of a car. We can drive around the streets, collect the data as much as we want. Then after collecting this data, we have to label it. And then this, this labeling process is one which is currently the, the bottleneck. So after we label this data, then we can finally train the model. So after we train this model, we can finish this training and deploy it to a real-world environment. So as I said, the data notation is currently the, the bottleneck because it's quite expensive. So it, for label this data, we need uh, manual work. And then of course, this manual work demands a lot of time, especially because we need several workers to do that. So this makes it expensive and for example, uh, for Semantic Kitty dataset, it took around 1,700 hours in total to label the full dataset. And it's not only the, the, the annotators that are needed. We also need to review the, these annotators or the, review the, the annotation from these annotators, then to validate that the annotations are correctly, to have some quality check. And then finally, we can uh, have this annotator, annotation ready to be used for training. And then, uh, specifically in the LiDAR data domain, this annotation process is even harder compared to the images. Just because the data now is a, a 3D sparse point cloud, and then the object representa representations uh, in 3D LiDAR data can change depending on the distance to the sensor. And of course, while the, the car is driving, we have many different viewpoints, which makes the changes of the, these objects' representation change even more during the, the driving. And when we think about supervised learning uh, methods, many data is necessary for training and to have a reliable model to be deployed in real world. So for example, for Semantic Kitty, we have uh, 23,000 scans around that uh, labeled. For no scenes dataset, we have 28,000 scans labeled, which are not comparable to the image domain datasets. So for example, ImageNet has more than 14 million images labeled. So there is a clear gap of amount of the labeled data between LiDAR and the image data domains. So this leads us some drawbacks of supervised learning. Of course, the data notation is needed for us to train our model. But the problem is that if we have few annotated data, this can lead us even to the problem of overfitting, where the model overfits to the training set, and whenever it sees something that is not on the training set, then achieves low performance. Uh, besides that, since we have many different uh, LiDAR sensors and also with different beams ma made from different manufacturers, and we can change also the different, to have this LiDAR in different viewpoints, and this will affect a lot the, how the scene is represented for the LiDAR. This can lead us to the problem of domain shift, where we are training uh, our model in a setup for, for LiDAR, uh, of a LiDAR sensor setup. Uh, and in this case, when we deploy this, to real-world data, which maybe have been collected with a different sensor setup, then the performance of the model will drop drastically, just because we have different viewpoints, and then how the scene is represented by one LiDAR can change drastically compared to the other LiDAR. And besides all of that, we still may have the problem of long-tailed classes. So what does that mean? We cannot label everything in the world, so we have a set of uh, scanners that will be our training set, and then we label this. And in there we define an uh, uh, amount of classes that we are labeling. But of course, some classes or some real world objects will not be in the training set, which can lead to the problem that we cannot, we don't know how the model will perform 
when during deploying to the real world when a new object that was not labeled appear in the scene. So we also need to account for those long tailed classes, which are classes that are not labeled in the training set. So uh, with those drawbacks, one way to approach this is through unsupervised methods. So the overall idea of unsupervised approaches uh, is to extract information from the raw data. So then we want to identify patterns in this raw data and then separate uh, the data into classes or somehow use this information to arrive at conclusions about our data without using the labels. Some classical unsupervised methods were the ones based on clustering, such as k-means or Gaussian mixture models. Or another example of unsupervised methods were the dimensionality reduction methods. And previously those methods were widely used for data analysis, because then from there we could have a way to visualize better our data and then arrive at conclusions about the raw data without having the needing the labels. So in the context of learning-based methods, we can also think of pre-training the convolutional neural network. And to do that, we can define a pretext task, which is a, an easier task where we can define the labels online. So we don't need to label them manually. And then we train the model to solve this pretext task. So after we train the model, do this pre-training, then we can fine tune this pre-training the model uh, to the target task using the actual manually labeled uh, labels for the for the target task that we want to achieve. And the idea of this uh, pre-training is that we have a large data set that we want to pre-train it on. And then afterwards, after we do enough uh, training epochs over this large data set, then we can fine tune to the, our target data set and then hopefully reduce the amount of labels needed to achieve high performance in our target task. We can define this pre-training in, in two uh, Two cases, one is the supervised pre-training. So what it's commonly used in the image domain, we have ImageNet, as we saw that there is a million of images labeled in there. So then you pre-train your model using the labels for this data set. And then after you have pre-trained this, the model now should, have, should be capable of extracting uh, knowledge from the data. So then you use this model to fine tune to your target uh, data set. And hopefully then, even if the task is different from what you have pre-trained, the model should already have robust features that can be transferred to your target task and your target data set. Another way of doing the pre-training is the unsupervised methods. And in this case, you don't have labels, but then, as I said, you define the pretext tasks where you can generate these labels online and then pre-train your model without any manually labeled data. So what are these pretext training tasks? So the idea of a pretext task is that you have an easier task that you can generate labels online. So you don't need to manually label while you are training, you generate those labels. But of course, this pretext task uh, needs to be robust enough or meaningful enough that will force the model to extract uh, useful knowledge from the data to arrive or to solve this pretext task that you are proposing. So you can also think of what is your target task and then define pretext tasks closer to your target task such that the features learned by the model during the pre-training are more suitable to be used during uh, fine tuning to the target task. One example of pretext task uh, is rotation prediction. So in this example, we have one image, we sample one random rotation we apply this random rotation of the, over the image, and then the task is basically for the network to predict what was the rotation applied over this image. Then we can directly supervise because we have sampled this rotation, so we know what is the predicted and what is the actual target rotation to be predicted. Another example is jigsaw puzzle. So we have the input image. Now in this case, we divide the image into tokens, then we shuffle the order of those tokens, we shuffle them, and then we give this as input to the network. Then the task of the network is to predict the correct order of those tokens, and so then we be able to reconstruct the original image. And again, we have the labels because we have, we have done the shuffling, so we know the correct order, and then we can supervise and use this as a pre-training step. Another possibility as well is we again divide, divide into tokens, but instead of shuffling, we simply mask out some of those tokens. Then the task of the network is 
to reconstruct the original image, to reconstruct those missing tokens. And again, we can directly supervise because we know the original image and we can use this as a pretext task. A more complex, complex task, which is possible, is the so-called contrastive learning. So in this case, we still want the network to extract descriptive features from the raw data, but more simply, the goal in this case is to cluster together uh, samples of the same class and of course separated from samples from other classes, such as in this case, uh, samples of one dog are together and separate from samples of a cat. And how we can achieve that? Basically through data augmentation. So how does it work? The idea of contrastive learning is that you have a source image. From this source image, you apply several data augmentation to have two different versions of the same image here, which are coming, they are, can be different, but you know that they are coming from the same source. Then you use your model to extract features from these generated images. And then for the images that are coming from the same source, you want to maximize the similarity between them which are the positive pairs. So you know that they are coming from the same source. So the representation learned by the network for these images should be as similar as possible. So for the images that are coming from different sources, then you want them to be as different as possible from uh, different sources image. So for example, here in this case, we have a dog, generate two versions of this dog. The two representations of this dog should be as similar as possible, but however, for the, when we compare the dog image with the chair images, we want them to be as dissimilar as possible. In that way, we can achieve the clustering where images of the dog are close together in the learned feature space by the network, while separate from images of a chair. And how does it, it, it happen? Using the contrastive loss. So ideally, or how it does work, is that to attract the samples from the same source, we compute the, a temperature scaled cosine similarity, which is this term here in the, the loss function. And then we compute the same for between positive pairs and uh, we, uh, between negative pairs. But then in the loss function, here in the softmax uh, function, loss function, what we want to do is that the similarity between uh, images from the same source or the positive pairs will have to be as high as possible while the similarity for samples of negative pairs should be as low as possible. Therefore, by optimizing this loss, we want to guarantee that similarity will increase from images from the same source, while decrease for uh, images from different sources. And as I said, data augmentation is a, a, plays an important role in contrastive learning. Here are some examples of data augmentations that we can apply over images. So for example, we could from the source image, apply random crop, and then we hay scale it back to the original size of the image. Or we could apply color jittering, where we sample random noise, and for each color channel in the RGB image, uh, we add this random noise, or random flip, where we randomly flip the image. And by aggregating all those data augmentations together, we want to have quite different versions of the same source image, to then use the contrastive loss to uh, learn to extract meaningful features from the image without having the any labels. So if we now think on dense prediction tasks such as semantic and panoptic segmentation, we want to use the contrastive learning to train the model to extract pixel-wise uh, information, right? Because we have a dense prediction, we want to predict in the end in the target task one information per pixel. Therefore, we also want during pre-training learn meaningful representations in, at pixel level. So we follow the same scheme. So we generate random data augmentation, apply data, data augmentation to generate random views of the same image. But in this case, the positive pairs will not be represent, representations for the whole image, but we have now pixel-wise uh, features that the network is extracting, and our positive pairs will be the corresponding pixel on both generated uh, random generated images. And the negative pairs can be both non-corresponding pixels of the same image, but also pixels of the other images. And then the task in this case is to discriminate or distinguish pixels that are similar and pixels that are dissimilar. So in summary, 
the goal of those pretext tasks is to define a task that can have the labels, we can generate the labels online, but it still requires the models to learn useful features such as texture, shape, and color, such that we can use this uh, paternity model to fine tune to the target task, which would require hopefully less labels to achieve high performance. Then after this pre-training, uh, we can save this, this, this pre-trained model and use it on different tasks by just fine-tuning to the target task using the corresponding labels for the, the task that we want to, to achieve. So we have seen now some unsupervised methods to extract information from raw data, but how can we apply it to the autonomous driving context, which is what we care about uh, in this lecture? So we can think of a LiDAR scan as an image. So, one well, LiDAR scan is corresponding to an image, and then we can think of the points of this LiDAR as the pixels of the image, but instead of having RGB values, we have X, Y, Z, and an intensity value over each point. Uh, since we are targeting now specifically on an outdoor urban environment, we can introduce some domain-specific knowledge and exploit uh, some assumptions about the data to help to, to achieve uh, the target test that you want. So uh, we have some prior knowledge about our data. You can reason about the data and application that we want to, to achieve. And then given this prior knowledge, we can either use this prior to achieve the target task, or we can use this prior as a pretext task to train the network. And then we have this pre-training, and then afterwards we can fine tune to the actual target task that we want. So in this self-driving cars context, especially with LiDAR sensors, uh, we can define the unsupervised per perception methods into, we can divide them into geometric-based methods, or we can divide them into learning-based methods. So depending on the task that we want to achieve, each one of the methods has advantages and disadvantages. So, but then we now we can take a, a better look into some tasks that can be done using geometric or learning-based methods without using the labels, so in an unsupervised manner. Uh, one, one important task in a self-driving context is the ground segmentation. Why is it important? Because by segmenting the ground, as you can see here in the image, we can separate uh, the drivable area here in green, so the ground points, with the non-drivable area or the non-ground points, which are the red points. Of course, not, not all the, the green area is drivable, actually. We should just drive over the road. But since we have uh, the context of self-driving cars or of an urban street, by knowing where is the ground, we also can ha take another assumption or we can ha uh, have some geometry information of the street because we know that when we are on the street, the sides are on the ground, the sides will be sidewalks and the actual drivable area should be usually in right in the middle of the, the, the ground. So therefore, even though we don't know exactly uh, we, where is sidewalk, where is road, by knowing where is the ground, we can already have some assumptions or have some better knowledge about the environment that we, we are. And how can we have this ground segmentation without using labels? We know that the ground is a plane. One possibility could be just to fit one big plane for the whole image. But of course, as mentioned before, lidars are sparse and the representation of the lidar scene can change depending on the distance of the to, to the sensor. So one way that we can do uh, ground segmentation and increase the, the, the resolution of the ground segmentation is that we can divide the scene or the scan into a concentric uh, zone where we have a grid map where as we are get far away from the, the sensor, we have a bigger grid. And as we get closer to the sensor, we have a smaller grid. This is important because when we are far away from the sensor, the point cloud gets sparser. So if we have a bigger, we may need a bigger grid so we can have more samples to fit our plane, which is the opposite when we are closer to the sensor because we have already quite dense point clouds. So we can have a small grid so we can fit smaller regions uh, of the ground around us. <coughs> so then after we divide the, the scene into these beams, we can apply plane fitting instead of the whole scan. Over each grid beam, we, we apply the plane fitting, and then we can separate for each beam which region is ground and which region is non-ground points. We aggregate them together all the beams prediction, and then we can arrive 
in the end a more fine-grained ground estimation. Here in this video we can see the, the result of this iterative process where we divide the, the, the scene into these beams. So in green we have the ground and in red the non-ground points. And we can see that by only using geometric information we could have a quite good uh, estimation where is the ground and where is the non-ground area in this, in this scene. <coughs> So now, with this uh, geometric information, we could divide the ground and non-ground points. So, good, now we have the ground information. But what else what we could do is that, now that we also have the non-ground information, we know that the non-ground information can be divided into the objects that are in the scene. Because the scene is not only com com composed by ground and non-ground, it's composed by ground and several structures and objects around the, the car. So then, the next step that we can try to do is to divide the, the non-ground points into instances and then identify those objects and give or assign a new unique ID for each one of those objects. And this is also important because by separating the, from, from there, by assigning the unique ID for each instance, we can separate background and foreground objects and therefore we can have a better scene understanding of the, the, the scenario that we are driving around and then no regions of interest that we should take a look or that we should care about like the instances that are around the car even though we may not know their, their, their classes. So how can we do that? So again we can take some assumptions about autonomous driving scenario. We are in an outdoor environment and then do it to the uh, scene scale. We know that the objects will not be super crowded usually except for maybe some pedestrians but overall we know that parked cars or the cars driving around, they will not be touching each other. They should be a bit uh, far away. And then we also, if you look here, we don't have a ceiling. So the main connection between all these structures is the ground. But now that we have learned how to extract the ground or separate the ground from non-ground, if we now remove the ground, then we can see again. We have different objects in the scene that are well separated because of the, the, the scene that we are, this outdoor urban environment. And looking from a top view, we can see that the individual objects are easily separated from each other, right? So they are fairly distant. As I said, in this urban environment, the cars should not touch each other, so, so they are apart from each other. And again, the main connection between all these structures were the ground, which you managed to, to remove. Then now, since you have this, now those points, the non-ground points, if you just apply geometric clustering, this is what we could get. So we have different colors, which represents different instance ID. And then by just applying clustering and using only geometric information, we could achieve this class agnostic instance segmentation. So we know where is each instance. We may not know their classes, but we know that there is something there or one unique instance in that region, which we can uh, consider and then take into account during the planning or decision making. So again, here using only geometric information, we could achieve instant segmentation, class agnostic instant segmentation in an unsupervised manner by just leveraging uh, geometric information and taking some assumptions or introducing domain specific knowledge over our data. Now we can also take a look uh, into learning based models. So for such methods, as said before, as an image for LiDAR is the same. Uh, we need a training set. So we have a search domain, which is our training set, and we may have a different target domain. And why this may happen? Basically because we have several manufacturers of LiDARs. So we have also for each manufacturer, we also have different number of beams or different resolutions of LiDARs. So this can change drastically uh, how each LiDAR sees the world. Also, if we change the mounting of the sensor on the car, this can also have a high impact on how the, the, the environment is perceived. So this can lead us to the problem of overfitting, which means that the network can only predict well uh, training samples. And when we are trying to predict something other or from a different, from, from data that's not on the training uh, data set, we will arrive only at poor performance. We can divide this problem into two. One is uh, the training the data overfitting which means that maybe your training data is small or you are just training for so long in your training data set 
that the network basically just memorized the training set. So even if you present to the network something collected with the same LiDAR, with the same sensor mount, the performance will be low because you just have overfitted to your training data set and nothing else other than the training data set will have a good performance. Another problem, as mentioned, is the domain shift. So this occurs when you change the domains that you are using and this change of domain can be caused by using a different sensor or collecting data at different places, maybe different cities or maybe collecting data in different seasons of the year. So this can lead to domain shift because maybe you are passing over the same street but you train in a, your model during spring and now that you are in autumn the scene changes completely because of the trees and then the leaves in the ground so this is, can be one of the causes of domain shift. So we have those two types of problems that can lead to overfitting to the training dataset. So first, uh, to deal with the problem of domain shift, uh, we can think of adapting the trained model. So you have your trained model, and then we can try to adapt it to cope with this domain shift problem, ideally without having to label more data. So we can only use already the search the data labels and then using that we can should we want to try already to adapt this model to perform well also on the target data set. So for example here we have two data sets uh, on LiDAR data. One is Cement Kikiri and one is Nusin. So <coughs> what we can already notice if you look closely we see that the, the Cement Kikiri data set is denser than the Nusin. This is caused because Cement Kikiri dataset was collected with a, a, a higher resolution LiDAR, while the NuSynes has less beams, so it's a lower resolution. That's why the point cloud here in Cement Kikiri is denser than the NuSynes, which is way sparser when you compare both datasets. So this is one example of domain shift. And then it's also we, uh, one of the problems that we want to, to tackle, trying to, given we have a trained model on Cement Kikiri, how this could also perform well when we try to predict some scenes in new scenes. So one way of, to tackle domain shift is uh, in a database way. So given our search domain with its labels, we virtually generate scans from the target domain. So in the previous example, Cement Kitty and new scenes, we have our data set on Cement Kitty. We try to generate virtual scans from Cement Kitty that has less uh, beams. So for example, we could just maybe uh, jump some of the, the beams that are collected on, on Cement Kitty, try to arrive at the same resolution as new scenes. And since we have the labels for the search uh, domain, then we just, on the virtually generated scans, we also use the same labels and then we train for both. So we train for both the original data set and for the generated, uh, virtually generated scans. In another way, could be the model-based uh, domain adaptation, which means that we have the search domain with the labels, we train the model on the search domain, and for the target domain, we just predict it. We don't have the labels for the target domain, but we get the, the predictions. Then what we do is that, given the predictions of the search and the target domain, we try to increase the similarity between the data distribution of the search and the target domain. And more than that, we also, for each class in both uh, on, on the, the data set, on the predictions, we get per class uh, feature representation. And again, we try to match the, this feature representation or increase the similarity between each class feature representation for both source and target domain. In that way, we are just training for the, tar for the source uh, domain, but we are trying to get the data distribution of the predictions in the source, uh, in, sorry, in the target domain to match with the data distribution of the search domain. So this is how to tackle the domain shift. But as mentioned before, another possibility uh, to deal with the overall uh, overfitting is through pre-training. So as mentioned, for image domain, we can define the pretext task. And for point cloud, we can do the same. For example, we could define a point cloud reconstruction, or also we could use contrastive learning to pre-train the model and later fine-tune to the target task, which could be cement segmentation, point-up segmentation, or object detection, or any other task that you have in mind. So for point cloud uh, reconstruction, one thing that we could do is, given that we have the full object uh, 3D representation, we sample 
uh, random viewpoints over this object. Then we render only or we sample only the partial point cloud that could be seen from this random view that we are sampling. And then this is our input signal. We have this partial point cloud, we put this over the network, and then the network should uh, predict the full or the dense uh, object point cloud. And we have already the ground truth, which is the original full point cloud. And after pre-training with this point cloud reconstruction, we can fine tune it to our target downstream task. Another possibility uh, is to use contrastive learning as before. In this example, we have uh, even one step further, which is multimodal contrastive learning. So in this case, again, we have one 3D object. We sample random views of this object. As in the image, we compute uh, features for each one of those views. And using the contrastive laws, we want to maximize the similarity between those two views of this object and make it dissimilar from other objects. But even more, in this case, we have paired to this uh, 3D object, we have an image. So we also have an image encoder where we extract one representation for, the, for this image and we want to match the 3D representation with the image domain representation. Therefore, we have a representation that is consistent both on 3D and on the image domain. So, however, even though with those methods we could pretend the model on 3D data, the problem is that those methods use single object point clouds, which are, of course, different from self-driving cars domain. Because in the self-driving domain, we don't have only one object. We actually have several objects interacting with each other in an outdoor urban environment. So ideally, what we want is to pretend the model not on single object data set, but on wider data. So this, we could account for domain-specific pretext task. And then, of course, the features learning during the pre-training step would be more suitable to be fine-tuned to self-driving uh, target tasks. So to do so, to we especially for contrastive learning, uh, we are highly dependent of data augmentation. So the data augmentation that we have for images may not be directly applicable to LIDARs. So we have some ways of doing data augmentation over LIDAR. One example is a uh, random rotation. So given the, the point cloud, we sample a random rotation and then we rotate it to try, try to change the scene. Then what else we can do is point jittering. So for each point, we sample some random noise and then we add this random noise to the 3D coordinates of the points. So the point cloud gets noisier, which makes for the network uh, harder or makes the two views that we are generating uh, for contrastive learning looks as different as possible. Also, other possibility is to try to imitate the occlusion behavior that happens on LiDAR scans. For example, here we can see the occlusion. So behind the car, the sensor cannot see. So we have this uh, blank region behind the car. So how do we fake it? One way to do that is that we sample random cubes around the, the LiDAR scan, and then everything that is inside this cube we simply drop out of the, the point cloud. So we try to imitate the occlusion by dropping some regions. And then by aggregating these data augmentation steps, we can try to generate as uh, two views of the same scene as different as possible. Then with this data augmentation, we can then apply contrastive learning in a scene scale or over LiDAR scans. So one possibility as an image domain, we could use then the, the, train, the, the network to pre-train on this by generating two random views of the same scene and then we extract uh, a feature representation for each one of these generated scenes. And using these as positive pairs, we use the contrastive loss to maximize the similarity between those two views. Then the thing is that by training like this, uh, what we will achieve, of course, is a global feature uh, representation because the task of the network or this pretext task is to match the, or increase the similarity between those two scenes representation learned by the network so then to do so, the network needs to extract global features of the scene to then match them together. But then if you look over a denser prediction task, such as cement and panop segmentation, similarly to the image, we can try to do this in a also doing a, a denser contrastive learning uh, pre-training. And how we do that? Again, we simply simple, sample two random scenes from the same uh, scan. But then we should guarantee that those two scenes have some 
a fairly overlapping region. And in this overlapping region, we map the correspondence of points on both scenes, and we save this mapping. Then we input those two scenes over the, the network to compute pointwise features, and after we get the pointwise features, given that we have the mapping of corresponding points around the overlapping region, we compute the contrastive loss such that the corresponding points on both scenes will be the positive pairs, while the non-corresponding points will be the negative pairs. So in that case, we try to optimize the pointwise features such that the corresponding points will be as similar as possible. And in this case, the network will learn local features or pointwise features uh, over the, the scene. So, however, uh, while global features, as in the, the scan-wise case, may ignore fine-grained characteristics of the points, these pointwise local features may ignore the context of the scene, since we are just looking individually over each point. So therefore, we can again use domain-specific knowledge, as we saw before, that we managed to, to segment the objects in the scene, to, to try to enforce the network to learn more semantic information over the scene. So as we did before, by removing only using geometry-based approach, we could have these uh, segments over the scene. Uh, of course, again, we don't know which segment, uh, which class it belongs to, but we know that this segment is one individual instance of something. And then we can exploit this and make the network learn by itself uh, some semantic information about this segment and what distinguishes it from the other segments in the scene. And how we can do that? Using contrastive learning again. So the idea here is that given the source scan, we first separated the, the scan into segments using the geometric approach uh, here. Then we save this, this mapping, these segments IDs, and we follow the same procedure as before. We generate two random views of this scan, then we pass it over the backbone, the network, and compute pointwise features. Then given the cement, the, this cement segmentation map, uh, we pull from these both views the individual segments of each one of those views, and it's computed pointwise features. So now that we know uh, the mapping between each segment in the corresponding uh, augmented uh, scene, we can then match their representations and use the contrastive loss to make uh, the representation of the same segment on the different views as similar as possible and different from the, the other segments in the views, making the network learn by itself what is distinguish each segment in the scene uh, from each other. Okay, so now we have seen some different ways uh, of using unsupervised methods to extract knowledge from raw data, which is good. But now we may ask, uh, what should we do with the labels now, right? We have learned a bunch of ways to extract information. Should we discard those labels? And the answer is no, because labels are still essential. So we can actually combine both unsupervised and supervised methods to overcome the problems of, a, of supervised learning. And then we can still use the knowledge available in the label data to boost the performance of the network. So we combine both and take advantage of both words. And one example of how to combine both uh, is the task of open word instance segmentation. As mentioned, we have mentioned, uh, we may have the problem of long tailed classes where not all the classes in the word are in the training set, but we still want to account for new uh, classes that can appear in a real world environment and here we have one example on semantic kitty. So we have labels uh, for person and car. And so in here in this image, in A and C, we have the person and car uh, both in the image and in the LiDAR. But then we have the baby stroller B, which was not labeled in the training set, but it's also of uh, high importance. So whenever we are driving, we identify those known classes, person and car, but when we see unknown classes that may be a baby stroller or something else that was not labeled in the training set, we also want to account it. We also want to know that there is, identify that there is something there, even though we don't know which class is it. So this is the definition of the open word instance segmentation. And how can we do that? So in this case, we can use both the labels and the unsupervised methods to uh, achieve this. So how one can do that, basically you can use the labels, the known class is already labeled, and then we add one extra class, which is an unknown class. So everything that is, is not labeled, 
will fall into this uh, unknown class. Then we train the model with this, and we get the predictions of, of our model. So basically, we will predict first the known classes, person, car, pedestrian, uh, cyclist, and then define those instances. Then the remaining points that are were predicted as unknown objects, we, get, we gather them and apply clustering again, geometric clustering, to separate those unknown points into instances. And therefore, we can separate the known uh, objects from also the unknown objects. And here we have one example how this would look like. So given the semantic predictions of our, of our method, we could identify some known classes such as sidewalk, road and the building, but then we could also identify something that is unknown. So it's not actually common to have uh, a horse in the middle of the street, but in this case there was this horse which was classified as unknown by the network and then using the, the geometric clustering the instance, this unknown instance, was then identified in the middle of the street. Here we know that this is a horse, but by the, for the network this is not uh, classified as a horse, it's just classified as unknown. But even though the class is unknown, it, it still knows that there is an instance of one object there that should be accounted for, and this is, of course, of high importance uh, in a real-world environment, because even though you don't know the class, you should know that there is something there and it should be accounted in your path planning and your decision making to have a safe uh, navigation through the environment. Another other possibility to achieve open world instance segmentation is through energy-based methods. So you can define a cost function and represent your point cloud as a graph. And then given your cost function, you try to separate the objects in the scene. Other possibility could be ensemble of models. So you have n models that tries to predict the classes of, of the points and basically you evaluate the n model predictions in a voting X scheme and then you can find, arrive at the final predictions given the predictions of each individual uh, model. Other possibility could be the softmax thresholding. So given the instance predictions and the class, uh, highly confident predictions, you assign the, the known class uh, predicted as the actual class of this instance. Otherwise, if you have a low confident uh, prediction for the class, you still consider this instance as one instance, but then you assign this as an unknown class, since you don't, your, your conf confidence for this class is not that high. So in summary, in this lecture, uh, we discussed some unsupervised methods and how to use uh, domain-specific knowledge to extract information from the raw data without any labels. We also discussed some tasks that could be tackled using geometric or learning-based unsupervised approaches and how to combine uh, also both unsupervised and supervised methods to solve more complex tasks in, re in a real-world environment. That's all for today. Thank you for your attention and see you next time.